state analysis. This from uh, Joy Reed. Joy. Perfect. The Kamala vibe. Joy Reed on MSNBC. And um, her uh, frequent and uh, always shrill guest, this um, lawyer of sorts, who uh, he's white hair, the white hair dude. He's the fat Don King, fat <laughs> a feet Don King. Okay. Uh, Ellie Mistal. Um, they uh, did a nice job reprising the deplorables riff, reminding the the country that um, the left doesn't just find Donald Trump deplorable. They find all of Donald Trump's supporters equally deplorable, or I guess the new word is the despicables. Also to do things, Ellie, that one would think are career ending. The way he desecrated uh, Arlington National Cemetery would be career ending for a normal politician. But his, his constant lies. But even this piece about saying, well, my building was the tallest until, you know, they brought down the World Trade Center. Now it's the second tall. I mean, everything he does is despicable. The reason why it doesn't end his career is because his supporters are just as despicable. All right. Like Trump's whole thing, he's a narcissist. Right. And so his whole thing is to have a complete lack of compassion and empathy for everybody else. It's all about him. That's why he lies about 9-11. It's all about him, 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 me, me, me. It's he's probably the least compassionate president we've had in 200 years since yeah. Andrew Jackson. And it works for him because his supporters are just as ungenerous and have just as little compassion and empathy for others. So when he is seen out there, uh, essentially, as as you guys have put it, desecrating our national symbols. As he, when he is seen out there putting himself above all else, his supporters also want that to be the case. They want to do that in their own lives. They want they, that's how they think of themselves, and that's why it never hurts Trump when he takes these crass and and classless actions. It's because his supporters think that being crass and classless is actually kind of cool. Yeah, and they also he he hates the people they hate. So when he makes up this idea that these Muslims in New Jersey mm -hmm. were cheering, and there are Americans in New Jersey cheering supposedly for the towers to come down. He's like, well, yeah, because my supporters don't like them. Mm -hmm. So um, the, half the country that supports Trump are racist, classless, ungenerous, xenophobic, ungenerous, uh, um, lacking compassion and empathy and so forth. I mean, I just thought I'd remind people listening who voted for Trump even if you just did it once, maybe you didn't vote for him in 16, you did in 20, or vice versa. Maybe you didn't vote for him either time and you're voting for him now. Well, if you're in any of those categories, then you're a threat to democracy and you're also a terrible human being. And that's not me saying it. That's somebody with a law degree who uh, commentates for MSNBC uh, and, and a Harvard grad. Do I read Harvard grad? So, um, you know, so factor that in. You know, if you can, if you can pass the... Joy Reid, Ellie Mistal, mirror test. Well, that's that's on you. Uh, I, I, you know what it really feels like to me, this race right now? What? It really feels like to me that um, we're back in 2016. And the left just does not understand how thick their bubble is. And there are some people on that side trying to tell them, and they're not listening. And I don't mean Quislings. I don't mean like the left's version of Adam Kinzinger or Liz Cheney. I mean like thoughtful people uh, who actually are steeped in uh, history and political context and analysis like Rui Tushera, I mentioned before, who uh, writes at liberalpatriot.com, talking about the working class problem that Kamala has across the board. Just to repeat, uh Harris is trailing Trump among working class non-college voters by 17 points. That's identical to the deficit Biden had against Trump in the last New York Times poll before he dropped out. Way worse than Biden did among those same voters in 2020, where Biden just lost by four points. She's down 17. Um, also, she's doing 10 points worse than Biden did in 2020 Again, among white working class voters, 18 percent, well, she's doing 13 percent worse, 18 uh, percent worse than Biden did in 2020 uh, among non-white working class voters. And uh, as everyone knows, there are a lot more working class, non-college degreed than the college degreed that to travel in the circles of Joy Reid and Ellie Mistel. 
Joy Reid and Ellie Mistel are not going to be enough for Kamala. For more on this, we're pleased to be joined by Darvi Omoro, CEO of the FCB Radio Network, co-host of the Outlaws Radio Show as well. Darvi, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. How do you react to uh, Joy and Ellie uh, reviewing uh, not just Trump, but Trump supporters? Well, the first thing that I thought about as I was listening to that when he said that he was the they said that the president that lacked the most like non uh, person that had the least empathy since Andrew Jackson. I'm like, Woodrow Wilson would like to have a word, you know, <laughs> and yeah, and right. and screened Ku Klux Klan propaganda in the White House. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. yeah. May, he may want to have a say about that. Yeah, um, but I mean, but but the tagging of Trump supporters. I mean, I, I don't know um why they think that's going to uh, aid the effort any more than it did in 2016 and and frankly uh, joe biden got away with it to a le- to a lesser extent in 2020 but that was a very unusual race with things like 70 million ballots being preemptively mailed so it but it, 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 i mean it just it just it doesn't strike me as uh the case you want to prosecute it's stupid it's stupid because Ultimately, regardless of what happens in this election, you know, if Democrats want to win moving forward, they're going to have to figure out how to at least peel some of those voters back. And just writing off all of them is political suicide. I mean, we are like I'm 37. Like, I remember when working class voters were part of the Democratic Party base. It wasn't that long ago. So you can't just write off whole swaths of the country and think that that's going to be effective for you politically, not to mention the fact that, as you said, and I I read that same article uh, yesterday, she's not only having a problem with working-class whites, she's having a problem with working-class non-whites. Right. So uh, you might want to figure this thing out. You might want to say, hey, you know what? Let's look at why these voters, who used to be the backbone of our party, why are they going in this direction instead of with us? Maybe they should start thinking like that. Attacking the voters is always stupid. Oh, well, and uh, you wrote a piece uh, in Newsweek about, speaking of empathy, about uh, the illegal immigration problem and how it is impacting uh, big cities, um, you know, and particularly minority neighborhoods, we've certainly heard a lot of outcry from uh, black and to a lesser extent Latino residents in majority minority neighborhoods in Chicago about this since the uh, importation began. Now, of course, you have it in, uh, occurring in small town America, places like Springfield, Ohio. And um, I know it's just given the back of the hand with anybody who says anything uh, raises any sort of concern or criticism is just doing so because they're racist, sort of like the Joy Reid riff there. You're just racist. But, um, you know, it's just it, that that's not very persuasive. Uh, and I don't think people are buying that. Oh, it's just uh, all latent racism that explains why people like, for example, in Springfield, Ohio, have a problem with 20,000 migrants being dropped into their community of 60,000 people. So, um, I actually probably I think last week one of my followers on on X knew that I lived in Ohio and they reached out to me and said, "Hey, do you know anything about what's going on in Springfield?" And so from that moment, even before the debate, you know, I started digging in and started researching a little bit more. And I mean, you're absolutely right. I think it's unfortunate when people just try to dismiss the entire thing because when you really look at it, you're looking at a town of Spring, Springfield, which is 60,000 people. In 1983, Newsweek named them as one of America's dream cities. And, of course, as a result of NASA and some of these other things that have hurt other Midwestern cities, it hurt Springfield particularly. Now they have about a median income of around $27,000 a year. Wow. And they have a 22% poverty rate. So this is a town of people that's already struggling, and then you bring in 20,000 people in a city of 60,000, and then the federal government gave them no help, no help whatsoever. Uh, 
no assistance in helping to integrate and assimilate these people. And so when you start looking at it, it's like, of course, there's going to be clashes. And here's the other thing. Springfield is about 20 percent black. So it's not like they've never seen black people in Springfield. <laughs> right, right. That's not the issue. Well, you're hearing from black <laughs> residents in Springfield, too. We've heard we've uh, heard Correct. from them. You've seen some uh, videos of comments during the city council meetings that have gone viral. Correct. Uh, absolutely. And, and so it's not a that's not the issue. And Springfield has been a place where uh, immigrants have been coming since around. They, they've seen an increase of immigration since like 2014. Right. It hasn't been an issue until recently because it's been manageable. They've been able to to bring in the folks and integrate them into the population and so on and so forth. It just had like with the Biden administration, when they swung the door wide open and flooded Springfield with all of these people, it overwhelmed the system. And that was what I learned when I started digging, started speaking to people in Springfield and really seeing what the situation is. But they, I mean, didn't the people in Springfield, well, the elected leaders bring this upon themselves because they started the initiative Welcome Springfield back in 2014. So who was coming back then? Correct. But see, the issue is, and again, it it goes back to uh, what's been going on at the federal government, it was manageable back then. Right. It was manageable in 2014 and 2015 and 2016. It wasn't until, you know, the the immigration policies of the Biden administration that oh now you know the status is probably <laughs> hurting us well, because now you have this flood of people in that they have to assist. And they don't have the resources to do it. I mean, it's right. It's just it's just this is where it's just like uh, the lack of pragmatism. So you, you, if you went to Springfield, you're you're from, uh, you know, some immigration agency at the federal level, some part of that uh, of that agency of, of um, resettlement. You say, you know, look, we're, we're asking every community to uh, step up here. We have these uh, true, truly political refugees from Haiti that are facing pers- political and religious persecution. They've, they've been given temporary protected status. They're here legally under that program. And so we need Springfield to take in a few dozen. And we're going to provide these resources and so on and so forth. There wouldn't be pushback. There wouldn't be much pushback. If you did that, you know, sensibly around the country, that's one thing. When you just, as you said, throw open the doors and say everybody can just come whenever they want on their own terms, regardless of what their intentions are, and everybody's supposed to figure it out on the fly— or we're flying people to these particular destinations that we've arbitrarily uh, designated, well, that's when you run into problems. And it's it, it, it's so incompetent, it almost comes across as purposeful, like there's a, a, a purposeful effort to be divisive. Yeah, it's absolutely incompetent. And, you know, one of the things I mentioned in my Newsweek piece is this situation isn't fair for anyone, right? Like you're putting the Haitians in a difficult position because they're you're you're creating the environment for them to be in unnecessary clashes with the residents and the residents themselves are just trying to survive of course there's going to be some resentment when you have people in a city that point that has 22 percent poverty rate and their the median income is twenty seven thousand dollars a year and then you bring in twenty thousand new people and you give them more assistance than the American citizens qualify right. for, of course you're going to have resentment. Right. Uh, before we let you go, I wanted to get your handle. You know, the polling has moved around a little bit about this, but uh, on this, but there's been much discussion of Trump uh, increasing his percentage of the black vote in polling, um, you know, particularly among black men, but the net net is substantially more than the 8% he got in 2020 back when uh, you weren't black if you voted for Trump. Um, and so I, I, I wonder if you think that is real and there's real stickiness to that, that it may, may not be 30 percent or something like that, but he is going to do a multiple in 2024 of what he did in uh, 2020 among black Americans. Well, I'll say two things. One, I mean, the polls have been showing that for over a year now. Um, at some point, we got to say, okay, well, maybe there's something to it. Now, as far as like in the community goes, like, yeah, I can totally see that. I can totally believe that when you talk to people, if you put, 
you know, 10 black people in a room, maybe two of them are going to be Trump. Well, that's 20 percent right there. Yeah, right. right. So, mm-hmm. you know, he's been polling in the high teens, low 20s among black voters all year. So I do think that it's real. But the only here's here's the other question that I would uh, want to preface this by saying, and I want all the listeners to hear to make sure if, if, if you're a Trump supporter and you want it to happen, then make sure you stay on the campaign. Because the other issue is, okay, the polls are saying that these voters are interested in him. Now it's incumbent upon the campaign to go get those votes. Mm-hmm. That's it's not going to just come to you. You got to go get them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 right. You got to run through the finish line. Absolutely. Uh, Darvio Moro is a CEO of the of uh, the FCB Radio Network. He's also the co-host of the Outlaws Radio Show. Darvio, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And he joined us on our Turnkey Dot Pro Answer Line. Hear about the big stories of the day, then talk about them right here on Chicago's Morning Answer on AM 560. The Answer. Warning: The following ZipRecruiter radio spot you are about to hear is going to be filled with F words. When you're hiring, we at ZipRecruiter know you can feel frustrated, forlorn even, like your efforts are futile, and you can spend a fortune trying to find fabulous people only to get flooded with candidates who are